I'm Isaiah J. Poole, and I'm here with Erica Seifert from Democracy Corps. And we're talking about a survey that, uh, based on some focus groups that uh, the Democracy Corps has recently done on the new American economy. And Erica, I know that there were some very fascinating findings uh, that uh, you uh, got out of some of these focus group uh, discussions. Uh, that have implications for anyone who wants to try to alter the uh, political landscape. Uh, but I really wanted to get your sense of what was the most important takeaway from these discussions that you've had. Yeah, so I guess there are two. So the first is, um, you know, we've been talking to people about the economy since it crashed. Um, and we constantly hear people, you know, talking about about jobs and the character of jobs and you know what they can afford to live on. And in this set of groups, um, people were less angry hearing about jobs, but they're deeply concerned about the kind of jobs that are out there. And they deeply understand the jobs have been restructured in a pretty fundamental way. Um, so, for example, we had one woman saying that you know this is a middle class family. Her husband works two jobs and she works one job. Um, and they do that to pay the bills, to pay back student loan debt, and to keep their children in, in childcare. And in that way, the childcare piece, it feels like a vicious cycle, is what, is what she, she called it. Um, and then the other important finding is that people are deeply aware of inequality. Um, they understand economic inequality, but really their entry point is political inequality. And they, um, they strongly feel and understand deeply um, that the game um, has been rigged against them. Uh, and so they understand that there is this nexus of power between Washington and Wall Street um, that serves to keep the wealthy wealthy and make them even wealthier, and that um, is really working against all the rest. Um, and so they're, they're pretty angry about um, a system that doesn't function any longer for the middle class and that keeps these jobs you know, restructured that are jobs that you really can't afford to live off of. That's interesting. We, we posted uh, an essay on our website a few days ago, uh, headline, Where is the Outrage? And even though there is this anger, the essay said that this anger doesn't seem to be reflected in the kinds of manifestations of outrage that you know, we've seen in some other parts of the world. However, uh, there you say that there is this anger out there, and my question is, is there, are there signs that this anger can, be, can translate into something, and if so, what would it translate into? Yeah, it's difficult to see in these groups that there's some sort of a movement brewing, and I think the important thing to keep in mind, you know, with these working people and middle class families, is that most of their lives are spent hanging on, right? So um, we say in this memo that they're at the edge, and that's the truth. Um, a lot of people are working you know, to get by, to pay the bills, and can't keep up. And so when they talk about a good economy, what they're talking about is a few extra dollars left over after, after payday, and that's what they say, you know, a few extra dollars left over at the end of the month. And so it's really difficult to see people um, having the time uh, to be able to put into that. Now when it comes to the voting booth and this anger about this nexus of power between Washington and Wall Street, I think that some of it is um, manifested in a resignation, right? They're resigned to this is the power structure in the country and um, you know even though they put more blame on the Republicans so many feel that there aren't people in Washington who are really working for their interests. So if you're going to talk about um, this coming to life in a political way in 2014, it's, um, you know, it's going to be a candidate who really does speak about these issues that's going to, you know, turn on the political tables because um, right now, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, you know, sort of, uh, it's not, I mean, it's more than disappointment in politicians. Um, they don't really see who's working for them when it comes to the political system. And the other thing that I think you detected, and this has come up in several surveys that you guys have done, is that there is really the, the, the narrative that there is, the system is rigged against the middle class. It's clearly there. 
What's not clearly there is a belief that government, in fact, can be used as a tool to sort of break this and to make things better, better for the middle class. Yeah, Sand wrote a really great op-ed in the New York Times about this last year, that when um, you have anger um, against government and when people are angry about government, um, progressives are in a difficult position to sell their solution, which, um, you know, in a in a sort of singular way when they boil it down, you know, conservatives are against government, progressives are for government, and it does make it hard for progressives to sell government um, solutions. But when it comes to specific government solutions, there actually is a lot of support because, you know, most people interact with the government in ways that work, right? Um, you know, there is a lot of anger about the education system, but people aren't angry about education um, and want to cut money from it. Right? They yeah. want more teachers, better schools. Um, and when it comes to roads and bridges, um, their anger isn't that we should privatize roads and bridges, certainly. And their interactions with Social Security and Medicare, they interact with a lot of programs that work really well for them. And those are not programs they're willing to cut by any means. So what are the winning messages then that progressives sort of can take into this uh, political landscape? Yeah, so we're just starting to um, to craft our messages out of these, but um, I think one of the strongest is about a long-term solution. So when you talk about investing in the economy, they don't want to hear about a short-term answer to what they really see as long-term problems, right? Deep long-term problems in terms of restructuring income and those things. Um, so when you talk about investing in the economy, it's about education, it's about technology, it's about investing for the long term um, to make uh, the country compete. Um, and then when you talk about jobs, um, the message can't just be about jobs. You know, they see the jobs numbers growing every month, but they question about what the, what kind of jobs they are. And so it has to be about good jobs, jobs that provide enough income for a middle class family to live on and the benefits to make their lives work. And I think that this is going to have to include in the future an answer on childcare because there aren't a lot of families who can get by anymore on a single income. And we're talking to families who are trying to get by on three incomes. Childcare has to be part of that solution for sure. Well, we really do need an economy that works uh, so that uh, we can get back to the economy that we used to have where you know, you, uh, a, a household could get by, in fact, on one job or maybe one and a half jobs instead of three. That's right. Well, Erica, thank you very much for your time, and we'll be looking forward on democracycore.com for future uh, surveys and uh, insight into the American electorate. Thank you.